Welcome to the third lecture in the series Global Diseases, Voices from the Vanguard. Voices from the Vanguard is a joint effort between the Center for Tropical and Emerging Water Diseases and the Knight Chair in Health and Medical Journalism at Thomas of the Grady College of Journalism and Mass Communication with assistance from the Office of Provost. And I'm very glad that all of you are here tonight. Thank you for coming. It is a very lovely spring evening. As most of you know, this lecture series is intended to help create and strengthen the interest in global health that exists across the breadth of the UGA campus. Both speakers thus far in this year's series, Eric Otteson and Zeta Rosenberg, have provided their frontline visions of how they think people can make a difference in global health. And tonight, Dr. Roger Glass, the director of the NIH's Fogarty International Center and a world-renowned expert on rotaviruses, is here to share his insights into the realities, the challenges, and the opportunities to improve global health. Before I ask Dr. Phil Williams, the dean of UGA's College of Public Health, to introduce Dr. Glass, I'd like to first remind you of two things. Actually, three things. Um, one is, this is a blue card event, and so seek out the person for that. Uh, second, on April 24th, we'll, we will wind up this year's Voices from the Vanguard with one of the actual voices, someone who speaks on this, Dick Thompson, the spokesperson for the World Health Organization in the area of global infectious diseases, will be here at April 24th, and I hope you all plan to hear this and his perspective. And then the last thing is, as always, there will be a reception next door in Dennis Denian Hall following tonight's lecture. Now I'm pleased to ask Dean Williams to introduce the speaker. We're very pleased to have Dr. Roger Glass visit UGA, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about him. He received his undergraduate degree from Harvard College and his MD degree from Harvard Medical School and his Master's of Public Health from the Harvard School of Public Health. He also earned a PhD in microbiology in Sweden. He has spent the last 30 years working in several positions between the CDC and NIH. Through both the good times and the bad times, Dr. Glass has been on the front lines of rotavirus research and can provide a broad perspective of public health, including work as a bench scientist, as a field epidemiologist, and as a public health policymaker. His research has targeted epidemiologic studies for the introduction of rotavirus vaccine. He has maintained field studies throughout the world, including studies in countries such as India, Bangladesh, Brazil, Mexico, Russia, Vietnam, and China, just to name a few. A complete listing of his awards and memberships would be too extensive to, to do here tonight, but just to give you a few of them, he's a member of the Institute of Medicine of National Academy, a member of the American Academy of Microbiology, and he's received the Outstanding Service Medal from the U.S. Public Health Service. He is author or co-author of four hundred publications, and he is fluent in lectures in five languages. Last June, Dr. Glass began his current duties as Director of the Poverty International Center and Associate Director for International Research at NIH. As many of you know, the Poverty International Center is the international component of the NIH and addresses global health challenges. Tonight, Dr. Glass will be discussing global health in the 21st century lessons from rotavirus. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Glass. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. I'm delighted to be here today, particularly because when I came in the door, I saw the writing in chalk on the doorstep that said, for everything in love. Is that why you came? <laughs> How many of you actually have heard of rotavirus? Raise your hands. Oh my gosh, I'm amazed. You know, when I went back to CDC in 1986 to talk about ro to, to, having worked in Bangladesh and at NIH, I went to the director of CDC and I asked him about rotavirus and he was welcoming me back and I spent an hour telling him all about rotavirus, the disease and its prevention in my work in Bangladesh. And afterwards, he wrote me a note welcoming me back and he wrote to me as the chief of the retrovirus laboratory. 
he didn't know the difference between a retrovirus and a rotavirus. Remember, they both start with R. And I realized that I had an up, upward battle to, um, to attack. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my, my love of rotavirus, if you will, the lessons that I've learned from rotavirus and global health, and how that's led me to my current job. But before I begin, um, I, I'm amazed that you've all come to hear about diarrheal diseases before dinner. So we'll, we'll, we'll move on. My, my undergraduate major was in the history of medicine, history of science. And I was very interested in, uh, in the epidemiology of cholera, because cholera is the, the basis of, of epidemiology and global health. You know, the quarantine system and the public health service hospitals in the US were all based, based around cholera. And epidemiology really came from John Snow identifying the Broad Street pump here in London in 1854, plotting out these little cases of cholera and showing that epidemiology could link these to the pump and that by removing the pump handle, you could actually stop the disease and stop an epidemic. So I figured that epidemiology was really simple, and I should go off and study cholera and see if we, why we still had a problem of cholera in the world today. Um, and also from the early studies of cholera, uh, there was the first vaccine for an enteric disease, a cholera vaccine, here developed in 1893. Never very effective, but uh, it was still the basis of immunology of an enteric disease, of a, of a potentially vaccine-preventable disease. And finally, it was because of this pump that I thought that if I went to a cholera endemic area like Bangladesh, um, the Ganges Delta, I might actually be able to take the, the handle off the pump, if you will, and stop cholera. So after I, I was at CDC for a couple of years, I went off to Bangladesh with my wife to see what we could do to stop cholera in the world. This was a, a, a naive mission of a young person. So it's not so bad to be naive and young. And here's what we saw. It's basically the same, the same pump and the same children getting the same water and getting cholera. So I figured that this would be an easy, easy match. A patient with cholera has severe dehydrating diarrhea. They can lose 10% of their weight in liquids in 12 to 24 hours. So if you're a 60 kilogram person and you lose six liters, you're, a, you're, you're on death's doorstep. And this is what happens with the disease. It's now completely treatable by rehydration with intravenous fluids and water and salt solutions. But in 1960, this was not so. It was a, a highly fatal disease. So here's a young girl and you can see that her, she's so depleted that she's shocky, her eyes are sunken, she has tenting of her skin under the doctor's hand, and she's at death's doorstep. With oral rehydration, she could get up and walk away. So it's with this that I, I got into diarrheal diseases and tried to look at how important were diarrheal diseases in the world today. Now, when you listen to CDC and, and our spokesman around, around the country, every year we've had a different epidemic. Smallpox, Ebola, West Nile fever, um, and the like, anthrax, but in fact, these are not the real killers in the world. The real killers are the diarrheal diseases, malaria, tuberculosis, acute respiratory diseases, things that are much less sexy, but much more important. So here I began to look at where diarrhea fit into the, into the uh, leading causes of mortality. And after ARI uh, in children, diarrhea is the next major cause of disease in the world. And of these, about 20 to 45% of these diarrheal deaths are from rotavirus, much more than cholera. So I scratched my head, and I think a lesson for you all is that where's your next job going to take you, and how are you going to earn money? And I decided that if I was going to work on cholera, it would be hard to find a lot of cholera cases when I came back to the United States. I better work on something that was global. And that which is global was rotavirus. So that, this, this background really led me to go to NIH, and then to begin to work on rotaviruses. Well, in the uh, one feature of rotavirus, which is very important, is that it's a democratic disease. Now, what do I mean by democratic? It affects blacks and whites, rich and poor. Every, everyone gets rotavirus. In fact, every one of you in the audience has had rotavirus in your first few years of life and probably been infected multiple times since, although without any symptoms. But that first infection can cause a severe dehydrating diarrhea that can be lethal, uh, lethal in a small percentage of cases. 
Well, here's rotavirus. It's the most common cause of severe diarrhea in children. Uh, it's a democratic virus, and of course in this Republican administration, I was advised that I should call it an equal opportunity virus, <laughs> not a, a democratic virus. So I'll, I have to change this slide, or I'll leave it till the next administration perhaps. First infections are symptomatic. You, there's good evidence of natural immunity. There are limited strains in circulation. And of course, my son got rotavirus the day I started the rotavirus lab at CDC. And uh, why would my son get rotavirus? You know, we have a clean house, we wash our hands, there's clean water, there's good food. Why does my son get rotavirus? It's not clearly from clean water, uh, poor sanitation or anything like that. We really don't know enough about transmission of this virus. But we do know that because we can't stop it in our country with clean water and clean food, that vaccines represent a way to prevent this disease. So here's a child in Mexico with acute, uh, unhappy child, a child who had for uh, 12 hours severe vomiting episodes, eight episodes of vomiting, couldn't hold the thing down, followed by uh, diarrheal episodes about 20 in a 12 hour period. And here the child is getting IVs uh, to prevent shock and to uh, be rehydrated. It's a very severe disease in a small number of, of children. And here when this uh, a child, this is an autopsy from a child who died, and the intestine is all uh, broken up. And what you see in the intestinal cells, all of these little dots here are the viruses. They've completely invaded and taken over the cell of this child's intestine causing death. So it can be a very severe fatal disease. Well, where, where does rotavirus kill? And here's the distribution um, of diarrheal death from rotavirus. And you can see that there are about 100,000 in India alone. Most of the deaths are in South Asia, about 150,000 in Sub-Saharan Africa, about 20,000 in Latin America. So if we had a vaccine, and we have vaccines now, these vaccines would be most helpful to prevent death in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia, South Asia, but in the US and Europe and, and Australia, Japan, they would really not stop diarrheal deaths. We don't have them. But they would stop hospitalizations, clinic visits, doctor visits, and the cost in, incurred. Well, here's the, here's the uh, disease burden. And as I look around now at the, uh, the importance of, of diarrheal diseases in general, this is really, this is really key. Every child here gets rotavirus, about 114 million episodes a year of rotavirus diarrhea. About one in five children will have to go to a doctor or clinic to get rehydrated because the disease is that severe. About one in 50 or so will be, need treatment as inpatients because the disease is severe enough to require intravenous. And about one in 200 to one in 300 will die of their disease in the developing world. So this is clearly an important cause of death. About 5% of all deaths in children under five will be from rotavirus. So it's because of this huge disease burden that I really saw this as a priority. Well, when I went back to CDC, we had no data on rotavirus in the United States. And you know, in the government, if you can't document how important your disease is compared to someone else's disease, you, you know, you're, you're, you're cooked, you just can't make it. So we had to go out with few resources and few people and figure out what the burden of rotavirus was in the US. So here's what we did. We looked at hospitalizations for children under five years of age. Here you see it here by month for a 20 year period from about 1979 to 1970, uh, 79 to 1998, 97. And you can see each year there are about 200,000 children are hospitalized for diarrheal diseases. That's about 10 to 12% of all hospitalizations of children in the US, a huge number. And of those, there's this winter seasonal pattern each year in children under five. And that seasonality is most apparent in children from six months, seven months to two years of age. And there's a little bit of two to three years and then it goes away. So a big seasonal peak in winter. And we've now learned that that seasonal peak of winter diarrhea is rotavirus. Well, if, if we were to have a vaccine, and we have a vaccine this year, 2006, for the first time, what would we expect to happen in a few years? 
Well, if we're right, and you can watch this uh, in the next few years, we would expect this curve to flatten out, those big winter seasonal peaks of diarrhea hospitalizations to go away, and we would have a nice flat line with a third less or 40% fewer cases, hospitalizations for diarrhea. Furthermore, in the first year of this program, we hope that these, this light blue curve of children under one year will go away by the end of this year or sometime next year. So this is one of the ways we're gonna monitor the impact of a national immunization program. So our disease burden in the US has very few deaths, but lots of hospitalizations and an incredible cost, about a, a over a billion dollars a year. Uh, and it's with this type of data that we were able to convince American pediatricians and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Policy in the US to take rotavirus vaccines for as a program for, globe, for US immunization, universal immunization of all children. So if any of you have small brothers or sisters or nieces and nephews who are just born or under one, they should be getting a rotavirus vaccine this year. Well, let's go on to the virology and how we get to this, uh, the vaccines. Here's a picture of a rotavirus, uh, a schematic of a rotavirus here, and it's a virus that's made up of a, a, a shell, a protein shell, an outer coat, like a basketball, and inside are 11 segments of double-stranded RNA, nucleic acid, and each of these can be separated on a gel, and each one codes for a separate protein, a different protein. Well, what does your body see when it sees this virus? What does your gut see when it sees this virus? It sees what's on the outer coat. Just like what I see when I look at you is I see your outer clothing. I see your clothes. I don't see anything underneath, okay? What your body sees to get an immune response is a reaction to your clothes, an antibody to your clothes, if you will. And in this virus, those clothes are on the outside. This bright yellow, the VP7, it's a neutralization antigen. And these little spikes that allow the virus to attach to your intestine and, and go to work. Well, this is important because it's against this outer coat that your body makes antibodies. And if we want to develop a vaccine, we have to entice your body to make uh, antibodies to these two uh, proteins. And if we can do that, then when your body sees a virus from the natural uh, uh, setting, it will neutralize that, it'll kill it, and you won't get the disease. So that's the idea of a live oral vaccine. So the vaccines that we'll talk about are live viruses that have been attenuated. They're, they're not pathogenic. They're given orally, and they give you a good immune response. Well, the other thing that's important to know is that rotavirus comes in different flavors that we call serotypes. And these serotypes are defined by the clothing that the virus wears. Again, that VP7, the G protein, and a P protein. And there are basically four different types of flavors of rotavirus. One, two, three, and four. They're very creative names, okay? And if we have a vaccine against these four strains, we think we'll have a vaccine against most rotaviruses. Just like polio vaccine includes three serotypes of rotavirus, three flavors. But also, rotaviruses can evolve, and new strains can always come into the, into the virus from rotaviruses from pigs, rabbits, cows, monkeys, dogs, and cats, and the like. So even if we have a vaccine, there's the possibility of new viruses evolving. And in fact, in places like Argentina, all the cows are immunized against rotavirus to prevent neonatal calf diarrhea virus, a disease that kills about 10% of calves that are infected. So there are already vaccines for cows. Now we're working on vaccines for people. Well, we're gonna go on and talk about vaccines. And when I was at NIH in the early 80s, my, uh, my mentor, Dr. Kapikian, was working on his first rotavirus vaccine. He took a strain of, of rotavirus from a monkey he reassorted it so it would have the outer, ca ca uh, outer coat from different serotypes of human rotaviruses, one, two, and four, and he made up a reassortant vaccine of four different strains that was called a rhesus tetravalent vaccine. And that was the first vaccine licensed in the US. It took 20 years, about almost 20 years, to develop this vaccine from 
isolation of the strains to understanding the principles of vaccine development. And as soon as it was licensed, August of 1998, it went right into uh, approved by FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. It was heralded as the first vaccine to stop those half a million deaths from diarrhea around the world. And the, about 5% of children in the US hospitalized for rotavirus. It was a big thing. It went right immediately into the routine schedule for childhood immunizations at two, four, and six months of age so that every child would get this. And we were really ecstatic. Dr. Kapikian and Ruth Bishop, who discovered the vaccine, and myself, we, we, were, we were overjoyed and we received the Pasteur Award of the Children's Vaccine Initiative. And we really thought we had won the world with a great vaccine and with the ability to have a new tool to stop a half a million deaths a year. It was an exhilarating moment. Well, you know, you can't be exhilarated for too long. And in 1999, when this happened, I had a full head of hair. I want you to know I was really, you know, <clears throat> almost an afro. It was huge. I lost it all in the next two years. And this is why I lost it. After nine months of immunizing the US public, 600,000 children immunized, a million and a half doses distributed, a great success in this program, we identified 15 cases of a rare adverse event called intussusception in a few children in the two weeks after they had received this vaccine. Half a million kids, 600,000 kids, 15 adverse events, and everybody raised the red flag and said, what's going on here? Well, intussusception here just is a cause of, main cause of intestinal obstruction in small children. Their bowel gets blocked at the ileal cecal junction. It telescopes on itself, uh, it becomes obstructed, and can be a lethal complication. You don't want this to happen in the US, let alone in a developing country. So we did an investigation to find out if this was linked to the vaccine, if so, what we could do about it, and whether we could get around this problem. And in the investigation, there was a cluster of cases of intussusception right after, in the two weeks after the first dose of the vaccine, a smaller but insignificant cluster after the second, and we really knew the association was real. But we didn't know the level of risk, whether this was one in 2,000 here, as it was first thought, or one in 28,000, as it was later thought. A very important difference. Why is it important? Well, in a developing country where one in 200 children will die of rotavirus, to have an adverse event of one in 30,000 would mean that you'd save 150 children's lives for every case of intussusception that might occur. So it's, it's, uh, it might be that in the developing world, this would still be a very useful vaccine. Well, my real target was the developing world, and I lived in Bangladesh, and this is where I, I was interested in protecting children uh, uh, primarily. So we called the ministers of many developing countries together to say, we've got this rotavirus vaccine, fabulous vaccine for protecting kids against diarrheal diseases, rotavirus, but it has this rare adverse event. Would you still use it? Would you still see uh, benefit of this for your population? What would you say? You'd save a couple hundred children for every adverse event. Clearly in the US where the disease is not fatal, the adverse event that might lead to surgery or obstruction is, is pretty bad. But in a country where one in 200 kids dies of the disease and where there'd be thousands of hospitalizations. Well, the ministers thought there and scratched their head and finally one of them from India came back to me and said, Roger, great vaccine, we would love to use it tomorrow. But, but the first time my, we identify a case of intussusception in one of our children who was vaccinated, the newspapers will be all over me and they'll ask the question, how could I permit this vaccine to be used when it was withdrawn from use in the United States for this very complication? If it had been tested here and licensed, it'd be one thing, but it hadn't been used, so I better step back. And so we lost the first vaccine uh, almost 10 years ago. And in that 10 years, about 4 million children have died of this, vac of this disease who might have been saved by a vaccine. Well, what we learned in, in the process was that intussusception 
uh, spares children in the first three months of life. And the part of our problem was that we vaccinated children up to six months. From three to six months, the rate of intussusception, for whatever reason in natural, goes up about tenfold. Half the children we vaccinated were over four months of age. They were in catch-up phase. Half were under. And most of the intussusceptions, 80%, were in these older children. So we told the other manufacturers that if they ever wanted to use a live oral vaccine, they should probably restrict its use to those children under three months of age for reasons we, that were not completely obvious. So here was our, our, our balance, our scale. Should we use the vaccine or not? One death in 250 children, lots of deaths and emissions, or intussusceptions, and we threw the vaccine out. Well, this has been an incredible year for rotavirus. And in 2006, last year, two new vaccines were finally uh, came forward and were um, uh, licensed. And these are the two. One is a, a single strain of rotavirus, uh, common human strain, that was attenuated because it was passage for a long time. And the other was a, a strain, a vaccine, just like the Rhesus strain, the first vaccine, but made with a bovine rotavirus that was much weaker and didn't cause, we think, the same um, wouldn't cause the same problems. And so these were both licensed, and in January of last year, 2006, major clinical trials of over 60,000 children were published in the New England Journal. For each of these, the pentavalent vaccine here and the monovalent vaccine here, and, uh, and they were really success uh, and a beginning, and these were nominated by Lancet as the best papers of last year uh, in the medical literature. Well, let's look at these two and see where we are. The pentavalent, just like the rhesus, given in th actually three doses, grows poorly and uh, was highly successful. 98% protection against severe disease in Finnish children and American children. So it was a good vaccine and it was safe. The uh, other vaccine, a monovalent, also um, grows well and it was very safe as well. And this one was tested in Latin America and Finland. So uh, it, it's gone, it's been, um, it could go forward. In March of last year, here's the president of Panama rolling out the first national immunization program for rotavirus in Panama. Another program took place in Brazil last year. So now there are over 90 countries that have a licensed rotavirus vaccine. Well, are we home yet? Do we, do we raise the flag again and breed success? Even though I don't have much of my hair left, uh, is it time to celebrate? Well, the, license, the vaccines are licensed in many countries, but we still can't celebrate completely. Well, why not? You know, I'm, as I get older, you'd always like to move the celebration date up, but sometimes it's hard. We've tested these vaccines in the US and Latin America. We haven't tested them in African children or in Asian children, for instance, in Bangladesh or India. And for oral vaccines, for parenteral vaccines, injectable vaccines, all children behave more or less the same in their immune response. And the routine vaccines that we give to children are all, all work pretty well. Oral vaccines are different. You know, the, the virus has to be swallowed. It has to go through the stomach's acid and survive. It has, to adhere, it has to be given in the presence of breast milk, and breast milk can neutralize the virus. Mothers in Bangladesh and in South Africa have high titers of maternal antibody that can make the immune response work less well. So until we get a global recommendation for these vaccines, we really have to know if they work. Trials of the Merck vaccine are just starting in five countries in Africa and Asia, uh, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Kenya, uh, Mali, and Ghana. And trials of the GSK vaccine, that monovalent, has just been completed in South Africa. So we hope that these will work, but the immune response in the South African trial is about half of what it is in Finland. And that suggests that the efficacy may be less than we want, less than anticipated. If we have a vaccine that's only 50% protective, 30% protective, would we use it? And what could we do to improve it? So that's the next challenge before us now. And whether by withholding breastfeeding, by raising the dose of the vaccine, by giving it a little bit later, 
we can do, by changing the buffer, by changing the dose, we might make it better. Alternatively, like with polio, we might try a parenteral vaccine and an activated vaccine and see if we can induce the same immunity that we get with polio with an activated parenteral vaccine. So, um, so here's where we are now with vaccines. We have two vaccines, the Merck and the GSK, that have been tested and licensed, but they still are waiting a WHO recommendation for global use until these trials are completed. And a bunch of other trials of other vaccines that are in development. Uh, and we hope that by having vaccines made in China, in Australia, in India, uh, in Germany, that we might have cheaper vaccines that would be suitable for the world's children. So we have now six candidate vaccines being made by 12 companies in five countries with the hope that in a few years, we might have vaccines for the world that will be cheap and affordable. And that's uh, our current research agenda. Well, when I went to ask ministers of health if rotavirus was important for them, most of them had never heard of rotavirus. So in Vietnam, I went in 1978, 1998, and I asked the minister if he was interested in rotavirus vaccine. He said, we don't have rotavirus here. I said, have you ever tested for rotavirus? He said, no. So he said, well, why don't we do a little study? And we got a grant from WHO to do this study. We looked at, five, at four cities of Vietnam, north and south, six hospitals, and we went out and we screened uh, 5,700 children who came in, under five who came in with diarrheal disease for rotavirus with a very simple but sensitive test. 56% of those children were positive. So that if uh, the minister saw this and he scratched his head and he said, this means that if I used a vaccine, I could decrease my diarrhea hospitalizations in half. I could cut my diarrhea mortality in half or some fraction of that. So this would be a fabulous and an important vaccine for us. So part of our efforts at CDC was then to go out and set up surveillance and let many ministers of health, like the minister in Vietnam, know the importance of this disease in his setting. We, went, we started out with nine countries of Asia, and again, Myanmar, Malaysia, 56% of their, of their children had rotavirus uh, as a cause of diarrhea hospitalizations and the like, high rates from 39 to 60% all around Asia. We now have surveillance all around the world in more than 50 countries that report monthly their rates of uh, rotavirus detection, and the rates are averaging 40 to 50%. So this is clearly a global disease, and just by doing surveillance, we've educated ministers and pediatricians of the importance of this disease in their setting. We've, we've also educated Bill Gates. You know, Bill Gates in 1997 was trying to figure out what to do with his money. He read the World Development Report, and in that report, it said rotavirus kills a half a million people a year. Our data from CDC uh, put into the World Development Report. He says, I don't believe rotavirus can, or what's rotavirus? I never heard of it. How can it kill this many people? What's, what's going on here? Um, he also said if, I, if a 747 crashed today, you'd hear it around the world. If rotavirus kills a half a million, no one hears about it. What's wrong with this picture? And so it was rotavirus that got him to invest first time in, in the uh, accelerated development and introduction of four vaccines. Well, after Bill and Melinda Gates got interested in this, they put some of their money, $750 million, into the Global Alliance for Vaccines. And that went to, uh, and rotavirus was prioritized with pneumococcal vaccine as one of two vaccines for accelerated development and introduction. And of course, the International Finance uh, Committee, Gordon Brown, Tony Blair, have gotten the Europeans behind financing this. So we've gone from an impoverished activity for a very important global disease to an activity now which is well-funded for further development and introduction should the vaccine test show that the vaccine is effective in those poor developing countries? So that answer is gonna wait for us all to see. So we're beginning now a great experiment to see if we can control and perhaps eliminate rotavirus through the use of vaccines. And for future funding, 
I thought we might call upon the Rotarians, for instance. Doesn't that look like a rot rotary sign? I thought that after the polio eradication, I need your approval on this because I haven't shown this to the Rotarians yet, but they've done so well with polio eradication that I thought we might just change it to rotary virus and, and, and continue their global efforts. Now, now with, with that said, I wanted to uh, go on and just give you a little, uh, I've made a change of careers this year and I'm still working on rotavirus at CDC, but I, I decided after 30 years at CDC, I should try to, I was a, a, an inch wide in rotavirus and a mile deep. We've worked on rotavirus and we've gotten it into national use in the US. It was licensed and used now. It's in, we have global clinical trials. What else could I do to improve the impact of, of global health and to make global health a, an important uh, study even on the campus of UGA, what could you do for global health here? And I think part of the reason I'm here is to get you all excited about global health. I hope I can do this. So I went on to, I went on to uh, the Fogarty position where I'm the director of the Fogarty International Center at NIH. This center is really dedicated to address global health challenges through innovative and collaborative programs for research and training, all stemming from the work of a bricklayer, John Fogarty, who became a, a, a union representative and then went to Congress, and his passion was global health uh, for reasons we don't understand. But, but because of him, we got a program 39 years ago at the Fogarty on the NIH campus to address issues of global health. Well, on the campus at NIH, there are 27 institutes and centers like the National Cancer Center and the Heart and Lung Institute. Fogarty, uh, Fogarty is, is the smallest, oops, let's see. Fogarty is the smallest of all the centers. We have a budget of about $70 million, which represents, get this, for global health, one quarter of 1% of our NIH budget. This is global health. This is what we have for global health. So it's a, it's a nice budget, but it really means that we have to be pointed in what we do and how we address this. Uh, and we also have to work with all the other centers because what part of healthcare and health research is not global in some aspect? It's got to be everything. So we have to deal with everyone and be really creative and partner. Well, we have research uh, activities in over 100 foreign institutions and 60 U.S. institutions, but ours are primarily in the developing world. Well, I got to Fogarty in June of last year and I was greeted by this portfolio that I call alphabet soup. Do you see all these different uh, letters and acronyms in here? I didn't know what they were, and you probably wouldn't either. But I did know that coming out of the soup was collaborative research, research training for foreigners in the US, research training for US uh, students overseas, and development of institutional capacities. About $68 million in budget with 400 grants overall. So I said, well, what does this mean? Let me put some uh, flesh onto all of these alphabet soups, okay? And so the first thing we did was to look at the first program that we started in 1988, which was called the ATRIP. I didn't know what ATRIP meant either, but it's our AIDS International Training and Research Program. We started in 1988, if you'll remember, maybe before some of you were aware of AIDS, AIDS was a disease of the United States, of Haitians, of homosexuals, and of hemophiliacs. And we didn't think beyond our borders of the importance that, uh, that AIDS would have that we know today. So Fogarty, as a, as a Center for Global Health, got a grant to invest in AIDS education and the importance of AIDS uh, overseas. And we invested in some of these young researchers well, these researchers have stayed with AIDS, and AIDS has become an incredibly important disease globally, as you all know. And these youngsters who we invested in 18 years ago have really become the leaders in their field today. So when you look at PEPFAR programs, the President's Emergency Fund for AIDS Relief, and uh, many other uh, AIDS research activities, these people who had early grants from Fogarty are now the leaders. They were in very important grants. Well, when we look at American leaders today uh, in global health, what do we see? There's a common feature, just like my own experience. One is that they all had what I call early childhood experience. 
And I would encourage all of you, if you're interested at all in global health, to travel, to find some place to sit yourself in an international setting and spend some time to gain the experience of what it is to work in a developing country or to address a problem that's really a problem of child survival or adult survival, something that's really important. That experience will open your eyes, will open your heart, and will open your careers to opportunities that you probably have never thought about before and engage you. And I would, sh so the first thing I would say is that all of the people who are now leaders in global health have had, like Al Summer, who was the dean at Hopkins, spent a couple of years in Bangladesh and in and Indonesia before uh, uh, early on in his career. Uh, Jeff Copeland, the former head of CDC, also spent time in Bangladesh early on. Helene Gale was in Uganda as a baby, as a young physician epidemiologist working on HIV. So the first, first important point is that early childhood experience. You're all children, you're all students. Look and seek for these opportunities because they will really change your career and what you want to do, especially when you're trying to scratch of what would be important or interesting. These opportunities are huge and they will entertain you for a career. The second is that all of these people up here work in infectious diseases. Aren't there genetic diseases overseas? How about cancers? How about heart disease? All of the, in the past, infectious diseases have been the king of international health. But I'm gonna tell you why that's changing uh, in the 21st century. And third, what's the gender of all these people? They're all men. And there are tremendous opportunities today. When these people were in medical school, women were an incredible minority. Today, women are about half of the medical students we have around the country. And so I expect that in the future, women will play a much greater role in these activities. Well, we have a program uh, at Fogarty to send medical students between their third and fourth year overseas. About 25 students a year matched with a student in a developing country, 16 placements in India, in India, Asia, Africa, Latin America. And these kids go off for a year to do a mentored research project. When they come back, they are different students. Their orientation is to what we can do to go back and solve the problems we saw. So again, this is a, opportunities are building. And in fact, about 50%, over half of medical students entering school today want an international experience, as well as many people in residencies and fellowships. Well, the second uh, area that we've tried to build up is to build up a constituency of universities around the world. We have about 19 programs in the US, um, and this is the idea of bringing together schools of public health, schools of nursing, graduate schools, schools of veterinary medicine, journalism, medical schools, all together around the theme of global health. And I think this is an incredibly important way to build a constituency in the United States. Global health isn't just medicine. If we want to deliver vaccines, you need a business approach. You need ethics and legal questions addressed. You have the ecology of these infectious diseases that requires ecologists. And uh, you need nurses to deal with the issue of administering antiretrovirals. Uh, Everyone can be involved in this, and journalists to take out the messages of advocacy and alert the public, behavioral and social scientists to figure out why people won't take their AIDS drugs or how to deal with the stigma of a disease like AIDS, which is incredibly stigmatizing. Here's what one physician could do working overseas. Dennis Burkett, everyone wonders, is it only infectious disease? Here, a surgeon went off to Uganda in the late 60s and discovered a disease, a big lymphoma, an African lymphoma of children. He didn't know what it was, but it was very common. And through going to scientific meetings, he was able to link this with Epstein-Barr virus, a new virus at the time. It's the first viral cause of cancer identified. So he did a great thing for oncology and for cancer. He then went to a meeting at the Sloan Kettering in New York and found out that they were working on anti-cancer drugs in the 60s. Let's try it. He was in Africa. He tried them out. It melted the cancer away in a few weeks and was the first, uh, one of the earliest successful uses of cancer chemotherapy. 
So a lot can be done. And where's Burkitt's lymphoma now? Well, there's an African lymphoma belt of Africa. These kids still fill the wards with Burkitt's lymphoma. He was un disappointed that this lymphoma took his name, by the way. And we're, we don't have a public health approach to treating the children with Burkitt's lymphoma or to understanding the mechanisms of their disease. So a lot can be done in other aspects of medicine, not only infectious diseases. So, so Fogarty is really funding other projects and trying to stimulate in institutional capacity and long-term collaborations. This year at Fogarty, we, we asked the question, we completed a project that's, that um, w asked the question, how can the world tackle its most challenging problems? What would you do as a minister of health if you were given a million dollars? Where would you put your money? Would you put it into surgery? Would you put it into treatment hospitals? Would you put it into prevention programs? Where would you put your money? Done by the World Bank, WHO, uh, Population Reference Bureau, and centered at the Fogarty. This report came out, and in, behind the report was this graph, which should be incredibly encouraging to all of you. It shows the, the aging of the U.S. population. If you're Japanese today, you can expect to live about 85 years. An American, somewhere between 76 and 85. And in all the areas of the world, life expectancy has gotten greater. Let me explain to you what this means in real terms. If you were born in China, 1960, your life expectancy was 39 years. In the year 2000, your life expectancy 71 years, okay? So the Chinese have gained eight years of life expectancy per decade for the last four decades, okay? The longest, the largest pro prolongation of human life in the history of, the, of humanity. What does that mean for disease patterns and priorities? 40 years ago, cancer wasn't a problem in, in China because many people didn't live long enough to get cancer. Today, if you're a smoker, cancer will uh, an kill an estimated third of the Chinese population by 2050. So as the population ages, ca cancer, heart disease, genetic diseases, obesity, will, uh, traffic accidents will all take a huge toll on the population. And the infectious diseases in that setting uh, will become less, less significant. The only place where prolongation of life has not occurred in the developing world is in Africa. And it's gone down, and we were just in South Africa. Life expectancy in 1975 was 53 years. By 1992, it had gone up to 62 years, 63 years, its peak. And from 1993 to today, 2004, it's dropped 18 years in the last 12 years. The biggest decline in life expectancy outside of war, okay? So clearly HIV is, has to be reckoned with as a major force in population dynamics and in development. Well, this means that when we think about the best buys in this disease control priority project, some have an infectious basis like stopping the AIDS pandemic and tuberculosis and malaria. Some that are very cheap are combating tobacco use, reducing injuries, reducing deaths from cardiovascular disease. So we really need to think about new strategies for public health and global health as we think forward. And the website for this book, it's a $250 book, but you can get it for free by downloading it from the website and reading the chapters that you want, dcp2.org. Well, in the Lancet, this is hardly, Lancet said in, a, uh, in October issue, health is now the most important foreign policy issue of our time. And I was struck by this because here we're doing global health. Foreign policy, global health today, I mean, I, you think of different things for foreign policy. And then I began to think, and actually, uh, in this administration, there's been the largest investment in major overseas uh, programs of any administration ever. The PEPFAR program committed $15 billion to treatment of AIDS, the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Research, AIDS Relief, $15 billion over five years to introduce antiretroviral treatment in, throughout Africa. 
The President's Malaria Initiative, $1.2 billion for malaria uh, bed nets and treatment in Africa. Efforts to control emerging infections in avian flu. So there's been, there have been tremendous investments, even by this government, in global health. So where has this led us? We also have worked in, intensively with the Indians and the Chinese. These were countries that 40 years ago were impoverished. And today, they're major economic uh, 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 middle-income countries with funds to invest in research. And the Indians and the Chinese are both investing heavily in research. What they need are ideas and direction. And so we have lots of collaborations with both the Indian government and with the Chinese to enrich and direct programs and research priorities in health, areas where we can all benefit. Here's a, a group of Iranians. We had a delegation of Iranians who came to uh, visit NIH. Arash Ali was the um, leader of the delegation. These guys say, what are we going to do with research in Iran? You know, we think about Iran in different terms, as you know. Turns out that they are a, a, a centerpiece for surveillance of extremely drug-resistant tuberculosis. It's the newest pandemic on the, on the planet. Tuberculosis strains that resist all antibiotics. So if we had it here, we would have a hard time stopping its spread or getting rid of it. No antibiotics work. Okay. In Iran, they form a, a window on the surrounding countries, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan. They get refugees in, and they have the diagnostic ability to, make, to, to identify extremely drug-resistant TB, make a diagnosis, and think about clinical trials when new antibiotics. If we, if we want to stop XTB in the world, we have to open up our eyes to all sentinels. And so whether this is in our own self-interest to know where XTB is uh, or because of the possibility of research opportunities to test new uh, antibiotics, this would be a place to go. So even in, in places like Iran, there are opportunities for research. Well, Fogarty, I said, was, is not a rounding error of our budget. It's a, we have a budget, but because it's small, we have to work with all of these partners. And it's really through partnerships with all the money that's now going into global health that we can provide some direction and some leadership. We have uh, foundations like the Gates and the Welcome, the private sector, many multinationals working overseas, government agencies, universities, and the like, as well as our own institutes on the NIH campus. So we are really trying to help provide leadership and coordination for these uh, global, global efforts. Dr. Zerhouni, when he recruited me, uh, is an Algerian by birth. He speaks French and Arabic and is really committed to global health. And so I was delighted that he has taken this upon himself as a, as a mission for the future. My own experience, will this help? When I went to Bangladesh in 1980, uh, under five mortality was about 120 per thousand. One in six or seven children died before they reached the age of five. Family size was about six, and there were over a half a, million, uh, uh, half a billion dollars invested in family planning programs to no real avail. There was, not, there was not having an impact. Immunization coverage was under 5%. Lots of diarrheal deaths and ARI deaths, malnutrition. It was, it was a, a terribly poor developing country. I've been going back every year or two and working with the uh, Bangladeshis and in 2005, the pattern is quite different. Under five mortality has been reduced almost in half in 25 years. Family size has gone from 6.3 to 2.6. How did that happen in 25 years? In a society where women have been kept indoors, uh, they, don't go out, they didn't go out after menarche, um, they stayed at home, they were uneducated. What happened? And one thing that happened was that women entered into the garment industry at the age of 13 to 21. They had a job. They had a reason to be with other women, to talk. They had health care on the job. They had a reason not to get married at 13 because they had a salary. They had a reason not to marry a man who didn't have a salary. They had a way to say no because they were empowered by a little money. They had a reason to delay pregnancy until they really wanted to get married. 
So I've seen this major change in Bangladesh society in 25 years, just watching. It's been, it's nothing less than a miracle. Diarrheal deaths have come down. Women only have two, two or three children. And the causes of death are changing. Uh, and some of these chronic diseases are becoming important. So now at Fogarty, we're involved in our strategic plan. And it really is based on my own experience that I told you from Bangladesh. First, that we really see what's critically important is to train the next generation of American and foreign researchers. And this is what I call early childhood education. This is all of you in the audience, OK? There is a future in global health. There's a lot to be done in the developing world. And I would encourage you to seek opportunities which are becoming more numerous and funding, which is, which is skimpy, but which is available. Because this, these are opportunities that will change the way you think about the world. We want to build sustainable capacity for health science research in overseas, building centers of excellence. And your group here at UGA are working intensively, for instance, in Kenya on parasitic diseases. And those centers of excellence will be wonderful places to be mentored for research careers. Implementation. We have lots of tools in science that we don't use. New vaccines, an understanding of the hazards of smoking, how to control hypertension, how to treat Burkitt's lymphoma, lymphoma. All of these need to be implemented uh, if we're going to have their impact. If they don't come out of our tool chest, they're, they're not of great use. We're trying to provide reentry support for foreign scientists to go home and make an impact uh, in their home countries, training institutional capacity and providing leadership and uh, collaboration for the future. Well, Tony Fauci, the head of allergy and infectious diseases, has always said, why do we get involved in global health? Why should we be interested? And he presents this slide, which is very important, of all the emerging infections that have uh, arisen around the world, which are a threat to the United States, to our homeland. And I've scratched my head with this because this is clearly a, a high priority. But beyond that, when we think about genes, if you look around at, at all of your neighbors and students here, 400 years ago, there were very few Americans uh, in Georgia, OK? All of us brought our genes from Africa, from Asia, from Europe. And it's those genetic diseases that we're now understanding are the basis of many of the illnesses in our society today. If we're going to understand these, these genetic diseases, it's really through global health. If you think of one in particular, Huntington's chorea, a terrible genetic disease uh, spread in family, a dominant gene, where, was it, where were the genes identified? Venezuela, offspring of a single woman who had Huntington's genes, who went to Venezuela in 1824 and has had several thousand offspring <coughs> infected uh, and expressing the disease are not infected. And it's by understanding the gene in this type of a population that with the sequencing of the human genome, we've actually been able to identify the gene, begin to think about uh, what we could do about the disease. When a therapy becomes developed and available for testing, Maracaibo area of Venezuela may be one of the first places to have an impact and see if it works. So genetic diseases. How about environmental diseases? You know, when I worked in Bangladesh on that tube well, remember the tube well? We put in the tube wells to stop cholera. It turns out that a quarter of those tube wells have high levels of arsenic in that water, heavy metal that's a poison. We never thought about this 25 years ago. But with arsenic in the water, if we ever want to study a problem of chronic arsenic poisoning and figure out how to address it, to cure it, to uh, remove arsenic, to remove the risk in the water, Bangladesh is where we would have to go. And this is true for many other diseases. Remember the, the problems in Bhopal with um, or Chernobyl with the radiation disaster? Where disasters occur, we can actually learn a lot about the diseases that will be important for those people as well as for ourselves. And of course, adult cancers, and I just shaded in the Burkitt's area in red, as one of many cancers which have high incidence, high incidence areas, and where by going to these areas and studying high-risk cancers, we can understand the etiology of the cancer, whether it's genetic or environmental, and we can think about new modes of treatment. 
In 10 years ago, the Institute of Medicine came out with a report on America's vital interest in global health. We're back with the IOM updating this report because much has happened in the visibility of global health issues in the world today. We think that global health is now at a tipping point, uh, a time when, uh, when major things will happen because so much has changed in the society. The introduction of the Gates funding and the other foundation funding of the rise of India and China as contributors to global health research, the visibility of global health problems, the idealism of youth that we can really uh, make things happen in global health as we've never seen before. So some themes for Fogarty, uh, we've been working on our strategic plan. One is that science anywhere helps people everywhere. Do you like that one? Or should we try the other one? Take science where the problems are, or science for global health. We're, we're, we're having an award for whoever comes up with our best brand name, and we're trying to get our strategic plan done by uh, June or July of this year. So uh, any, any ideas will be accepted for brands, and we'd be happy to see them. This is my, I've been, lived in Georgia for 30 years. This is my first visit to UGA. So I want to thank all of you crazy people who invited me here to speak to you. I, it's really delighted to be here, and I'm amazed at the quality of the research and the efforts that are going on in global health. I wish you well, and I would encourage all of you to go over to that department and see the dean and make sure you sign up for some kind of a project in global health. And, and most important, go overseas to some project or some place where you can actually learn from your experience. Thanks so much for letting me speak with you.